Good morning, everybody, to the third day of the school. And we start today with the third part of Jake's lecture on the estimated. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so today's lecture, I want to cover a couple main ideas. Uh, in The first is pretty foundational, which is how these diagrams that we talked about in the last lecture and we kind of built on in the first lecture um, are related to scattering amplitudes. And in particular, I'll sh we'll discuss the, the on-shell recursion relations for tree amplitudes in the form, the diagrammatic form that we're going to talk about is the way that they were derived, but we're going to use the proof that's uh, uh, um, uh, a little bit, well, <clears throat> so they were originally discovered in a paper which, I, which you should look at here, 04-12-308 by Brito, Cachazo, and Fang. And then a few months later, they were proven in pretty robust generality with, uh, with, together with Witten. So they're sometimes called the BCF or BCFW recursion relations. The form we're going to drive, the pictorial form at least, is going to be more in the spirit of BCF. So the goal today is to really get an understanding of what these tree-level recursion relations look like, how they, in terms of these on-shell diagrams, they represent tree amplitudes in, in several novel ways. And we we'll want to understand some basic kind of, um, get, gain some intuition about this unusual representation of, of tree amplitudes um, with, and, under, and remark upon some of the remarkable properties. Um, and in the second half um, of today's lecture, I want to go, it is, what I'm going to talk about is intrinsically connected to the Grassmannian, but it's, I, in some level you could kind of close your eyes and if you knew nothing about the Grassmannian you would discover that all of these pictures are actually completely categorized combinatorially. And this is something that physicists probably should have noticed early on, but in fact was discovered independently around the same time Brito, Cachazo, and Fang were drawing these pictures. Uh, Alexander Posnikov were, was drawing exactly the same pictures in the math literature, and it took the two communities about six or seven years to discover each other. Um, but once we did, there was uh, uh, laid quite a lot of foundations. Um, and so what we'll discover is that all these diagrams can kind of be erased, and all you need is some combinatorial uh, data. You don't need to, if you want to email your friend uh, scattering a tree level amplitude, you don't need to send them diagrams, you can just send them a, a bunch of uh, permutations, in fact. Um, and we'll see how to go from that combinatorial data into an explicit representation. Um, so that will be the second half of the talk. But the first half, um, so to start with the tree level recursion relations, the argument almost couldn't be simpler. Um, there are a couple small caveats, but we don't need to worry about those in this particular case. So last time we discussed this, uh, this operation of taking a, um, some diagram, whether it was an amplitude or just a particular on-shell diagram, and we added this bridge. Um, I'm actually going to reverse the bridge. Um, so let's, I'm going to draw it down here. And I'm also going to reverse the coloring, but Okay, so you, you add this thing, and what it adds is that it adds one new degree of freedom, and you get a d alpha over alpha times the, shift, the same function but with shifted arguments that depend on alpha. So this operation of adding a bridge result, takes, takes some object and adds, it sends it to this, this d alpha over alpha. So the idea is imagine that you did this to a tree amplitude. So we don't know what this is. This is how recursion works. So let's say we had some, S matrix for n particles. So it's a collection of diagrams or a, di or a single diagram, who knows? And it's cyclically symmetric, as it is in uh, planar, this is an ordered amplitude. Um, and we imagine adding to this a bridge. And you can add them to any legs you'd like, but if we'd like to get planar diagrams, it's useful to add them to consecutive legs, but it also doesn't matter which legs you'd like. And also, whether it's sh empty shaded or shaded empty doesn't make any difference either. I'm going to choose this one for reasons that uh, I guess are informed by what we're going to do on Friday. Um, but so I'm going to pick n and 1, and then we'll have 2 up to n minus 1 up here. Okay, and this has the effect of taking this thing here 
is a, is a sends a n the amplitude to some con to some differential form d alpha over alpha times a with some that depends on alpha. Okay. Now, if we think about this as a meromorphic function of alpha, which it is at tree level, so we're talking about tree level S matrices. So when we shift the momenta involving alpha, we can think about the poles in the alpha plane. So if we think about the, the alpha plane, there's obviously a simple pole at the origin which just removes this bridge. So this, the, remember the momentum flowing through this once we solve momentum conservation everywhere was proportional to alpha. And if we take the residue on alpha equals zero, we recover this, the, uh, the undeformed amplitude. So in the complex, or in the alpha plane, we have some, we can take this residue and this is just a tree, the original thing. Where the power of recursion relation comes in is from complex kindergarten, Cauchy's theorem. So we know that the sum of all the residues adds up to zero, and so we can trade the contour at the origin from all of, the, from, from here, we can expand the contour out and we can trade it for all the, the, res, the sum of all of the residues away from the origin. And we know what those are. Again, from locality and unitarity, or if we really want to cheat, we can just talk about Feynman diagrams. We know that the tree amplitudes are built out of Feynman diagrams. The only poles that we can have in a scattering amplitude are factorization channels. And if we're going to deform legs one and n, remember this whole thing is momentum conserving, and so the, if, so the only factorizations that can possibly depend on alpha have to have legs one and n on opposite sides. So we know what all of these residues look like. They look like factorizations where one and n are on opposite sides. So that's a, <clears throat> So up to a minus sign that I'm actually not getting wrong, but doesn't matter. The Cauchy's theorem tells us that the amplitude here can be computed as a sum over all factorization channels, a left, um, well, maybe I'll call it just left and right for now, but Oh yeah, we're one and n, so this is like one hat that depends on alpha, and this is n hat that depends on alpha, okay? Where you sit on some pole, so in some intermediate particle goes on shell, which means that the sum of the momenta between one and whatever n left is here, n left minus one, because that's, that's one through n left. Uh, well, anyway, the sum of all of these momenta have to be zero if it's a massless if we're talking about a massless theory. But the, but the, the catch, or the interesting part of this whole story is that alpha is not zero away from the origin, right? So all of the residues away from the origin actually correspond to on-shell diagrams where alpha is not zero, alpha is locked to alpha star. It's whatever it is, the solution to these cut equations. So if we pick out legs n and one, I always want it to be clockwise, which is why I'm doing it this way then we get a sum of pictures that look like one loop diagrams. And this is a funny looking relation. And I want to kind of dwell on this and we're going to ex explore what this looks like in a lot of detail over the next uh, half hour or so. <clears throat> First of all, um, provided this is a tree amplitude and that's a tree amplitude, it's pretty easy to verify that, that, that that, uh, so this is a generically, this is something with d hat equals zero. It's something that is generically non-vanishing for external momenta. It's a rational function. This is something with d hat equals zero. So there's a solution, you know, for generic momenta flowing into L, there's a solution, and for momenta flowing into R. And so you just cut these four propagators. There's a unique solution. This whole diagram, this is a long way of saying that if you have a rational function here and a rational function here, this big box picture is a rational function. So it maps two rational functions into rational functions. So even though it looks loopy, it's really not. It takes rational functions and ma makes rational functions. Um, and in terms of the characteristics that we talked about last time, we remember that there was a one characteristic was the number of particles, 
And obviously that's, I guess, being fixed here. But it's often, it's kind of uh, hard to resist also stratifying this recursion relation according to K. So if you wanted to fix K, the number of, you know, incoming, the number of sources on the left-hand side, this dictates how K left and K on the right have to add up. Um, and if you follow the, well, I'll leave that as a bit of an exercise. It's not that hard. But the K for this whole graph here is the K of the left thing, K of the right thing, uh, minus one because you, add, you bridged these two things together. And then adding a bridge preserves K. So that means that K is equal to K left plus K right minus one. So you sum over all K left and right such that this is true. And it's kind of clear that the N left and N right exceed N by two. So N is equal to N left plus N right minus two. Okay. So now this is a, this is a funny kind of picture for a tree. You know, trees in terms of loops. And it's, it's worth bearing in mind that these recursion relations were discovered empirically as a property of these little one loop-like pictures before there was a proof. Before the, the Cochise theorem argument is due to Witten mostly. So that was in the, paper, the subsequent paper. But it was discovered empirically as a property about these boxes. And what is completely incredible is that these boxes had been part of the vernacular of, um, of amplitudeology for about a decade before this because it was very useful for constructing loop amplitudes. And so there were papers and papers all drawing these pictures with representing these rational functions. This was part of the standard vernacular. And yet nobody had a good way of writing trees, right? These are trees glued with trees glued together, and yet they were using Feynman diagrams for the trees because there wasn't any better representation of trees. And now everything gets flipped on its head because now we say that, that actually a tree, a blob here, can be written as a loop. But it's a little worse than that. It's not even just a loop because what happens when you recurse? You feed this picture, this sum of things, into the left side and into the right side. And so you get loops and loops and loops. It starts looking like a very, we'll see many examples of this, but it doesn't even look like a one loop. Because, you know, imagine you put in this little picture here into this corner and this corner, and it keeps going. Another aspect, which is a pretty common aspect for these kinds of recursion relations, is that there are, a lot, there are choices involved. There are choices involved at every stage of the recursion. Um, the one choice is pretty obvious. We chose to, to pick out legs n and 1. We could have chosen any pair. Um, the non-adjacent pairs would have given us some unusual formulas that are actually pretty nice, but they wouldn't have led to, to, to planar graphs, so let's ignore those. But we could have chosen any adjacent pair to, to choose, so there's at least n choices there. There's also the flip. You can choose this one or you can choose empty shaded or, sha or shaded empty. And those are valid formulas. Um, and they give different pic di diagrams and they also give different functions. But moreover, not only do you get to choose that at that stage, when, you've, when you now look at this and you have to decide what are you going to put in this corner for the left sum of pictures, you get the choices all over again. You get to pick which legs on the outside you'd like to choose as your special legs, which bridge you'd like to use, and you get to do that at every single subsequent stage of the recursion. The end point of this recursion, so where does this recursion stop? It stops when um, uh, that we have the following things at A1, uh, 3, we're going to call, uh, so we put K up there. A1, 3 is this. Um, A2, 3 is shaded. And A else, 3 is 0. So this is the seed of the recursion. And you keep going and going until N left and N right are all three. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll get a trivalent graph, and that will be the, the picture that we're going to get. So, so let's, we're going to see this in a lot of detail here in the next. I mean, the, the way you explain it right now is not that terrible because uh, conversion, right? If you say that suddenly at three level, you have to do loops. Yeah, yeah. Also, 
They're choices, yeah, yeah. So, so there are two different levels of choices. One gives you different formulas and the other one just gives you different graphs. So we're going to talk about both of those here. But let's get some intuition about this. So, so the three particle amplitudes are locked, right? We, we talked about that from lecture one. Yes, Lance. Well, Cauchy's theorem is true even if there is a residue at infinity, but if we, there is, when we don't have a factorization for it. Yeah. So, yeah, so Professor Dixon is uh, absolutely right. So, if we use Cauchy's theorem this way, obviously we need to include a, a possible pole at infinity. And it is a special thing about Yang Mills and gravity, um, and it is not true of Phi 4 theory, for example, that there's no residue at infinity. The residue at infinity doesn't factorize. So, if you imagine taking the Phi 4 four particle amplitude, which is just a constant, and you do this BCFW shift, you get D alpha over alpha, and Cauchy's theorem tells you that the residue at the origin is minus the residue at infinity, you've learned nothing. So, so having good behavior at infinite momentum is important um, for the uh, usefulness of the recursions. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so in Yang Mills, if I had arrows everywhere, then there are bad shifts, there are, you have to be careful about which, you don't have as many choices as you can. So it's kind of a funny thing. You have to be sensitive to helicities if you're going to do pure Yang Mills. On the other hand, you can just do N equals four, be sloppy, you don't care about helicities at all, and then just project out. So it's related to the fact that that box picture that I had on the last lecture wasn't actually the tree for four particles. It was the tree times something for, for pure Yang Mills. Whereas in n equals four, it would have actually just been the tree, or the gluonic part component of n equals four, which has been the tree. Okay, so let's get some intuition about what this uh, what this looks like. So let's start, just like all good recursions, we start at the bottom and work our way up. So we already know what the uh, the, four, the three particle amplitudes are. What about the four particle amplitudes? Okay, so what about um, Let's just kind of work it out. So what, what is A4, zero? Well, we need to have um, N left and N right have to add up to, to, uh, to, to six, so we need three particle amplitudes there. And we need the Ks of the three particle amplitudes to add up to minus one if we're going to have a zero. All right, well, there's no way to add up with this one and one here. So there's no diagrams. So we'd say that at least at tree level, this is a very weak statement, by the way. I'll leave it as an exercise to prove on completely general grounds that in supersymmetric Yang-Mills, not even maximal supersymmetric, but supersymmetric Yang-Mills, this is true to all orders of perturbation theory. So this is kind of a weak statement right now. But at tree level, we've just seen there are no diagrams to draw. What about A41? So the K equals one amplitude. Well, this one does actually have a diagram we can draw. You see, we need, again, we need the uh, N left and N right are going to be three, and K left and K right both can be one. Oh, I should just point out that I'm going to call this term, a term in this recursion I'm going to denote as a left tensored with A right, or maybe I'll write N left, N right, K left. K right. Okay, so this tensor means bridge. So one thing that it could be, the only term that you could possibly write down in this recursion that has the Ks and Ns that add up, right, is the three particle K equals one bridge with the three particle K equals one. And as a diagram, that looks like, again, so the, the bottom part of this diagram is always the same. So we're going to pick Right, so we're always going to choose n and 1, so 4, 1. And the k equals 1 is the empty vertex, 2 and 3. And so we'd, we would discover that the, the four particle k equals 1 amplitude is a single term. Can anybody see something problematic or odd about that particular term? Well, I mean, technically it's fine. The problem with this diagram, and the reason why we normally don't include it, is because, um, is because remember that the white, the empty vertex tells you that all the lambdas of the legs going into this vertex are proportional to each other. 
So that means that this, that the leg here has a lambda which is proportional to lambda one, and this has something that's proportional to lambda one. But this also says that the lambdas of all of these three legs are proportional to lambda two. So we have that lambda two is proportional to lambda one, and lambda two is proportional to lambda three. So what it, this thing imposes a constraint on the external kinematics. It says that la all of the lambdas of one, two, and three are all proportional to each other. That's a pretty big constraint, you know, relative to generic momenta where none of the lambdas are proportional to each other. So, um, so for generic external kinematics, this thing vanishes. And so we just say is zero. But, you know, in the future, and if you're doing research in this, you know, I should point out that it's worth bearing in mind that this is not actually really zero. It's a distribution. It has a definition. It has some delta function support. And maybe it contributes inside some bigger diagram some later, and you care about it, even though it's very singular. For example, maybe it's occurring in some big diagram that's representing a loop amplitude, and these things are not generic external kinematics. They're something inside the graph that can be locked to whatever you want it to be. So, but for just external kinematics, this thing has delta function support. So this means has singular support. And by convention, we throw all that stuff out. Okay. So we conclude that A41 is zero. A similar argument goes for A43. So let's say A43 has a single term in it, A32 with A32. And the, okay, if I erase this and I say that this is that, it's this picture, which is zero for the same reason, just with swapping the lambdas and lambda tildes. In fact, we can see that there's kind of a more general statement here to be, to be made. Well, maybe I'll wait. I'll come back to that in just a second here. Okay, so what we see here, and we can also say that A4, 4 is zero. Okay. So of the four particle amplitudes, almost all of them are zero. And recursively, I might as well just, let's just generalize this. Um, I'll write it over here. Okay, so we can just write, it's pretty simple to prove recursively from what we've just seen at four particles. That means that n zero is zero, a n one is zero, Again, these are weaker than they need to be. You could prove that they're tr this, these are zero to all orders. Um, but a n, uh, n minus one is zero, and a n, n is zero. Okay, so we've just seen that a lot of these amplitudes vanish. Um, let's find one that's not zero. So the only one we haven't checked yet is k equals two. Oh, by the way, I, this is going to come up in, t in Friday's lecture, and it's a language that I've been carefully avoiding spelling out, um, just because I don't think the historical context actually, I don't find it especially helpful. But, but a k equals two, so I'll just, I'll just remark this here. Um, a, a, a n k is called, and an n to the k minus two MHV amplitude. So the Park Taylor amplitude, which at k equals two, is called at n to the zero MHV or MHV. So those are called MHV amplitudes. Um, these ones that are vanishing are quote unquote worse than MHV. Um, and uh, for higher k, they're called NMHV, N squared MHV, et cetera. This, um, I don't even want to tell you what MHV stands for. I don't think it's helpful. But it's a bit of language that can't be erased from the literature. So um, you need to know that it's called MHV. Um, okay. So let's look at the MHV four particle amplitude, this Par Park Taylor, the one that Park Taylor had this beautiful guess for. So in this case, there are two terms. Naively, there are two terms in this recursion. There's a A31 bridged with A32. 
which is, so, um, so again, this, the bottom part of this graph is always the same. And now we have 3, 1, and we have 3, 2, plus the reverse, a 3, 2 bridged with a 3, 1. Okay, and can everybody see what's the issue with this one, right? It's the same exact argument we had before, although it's not as severe. It's kind of severe in two different ways at the same time. But, uh, but you see that this diagram is vanishes unless lambda 2 and lambda 1 are proportional to each other, which means you're on a factorization channel. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 are proportional to each other, then P1 plus P2 squared is 0. So you know that this thing has singular support. And also, this side tells you that lambda tilde 3 and lambda tilde 4 have to be proportional to each other. So this thing is distributional simultaneously in two different ways. It's generically 0. For generic, if you have just momentum conserving kinematics, this thing is 0, this thing is not 0, and it's the right answer. So we're going to throw this one out. And in fact, now we can make our more general comment, which is that um, in general, um, a, if we have a three-particle amplitude on the left with k equals 1 with this bridge configuration, that is 0. So we have that a 3, 1 tensored anything goes to 0. And similarly, a three-particle k equals 2 amplitude on the right tensored with anything on the left goes to zero. So we systematically throw those out. And again, it's worth remembering, you know, sometime, uh, you know, years from now when you're playing some games, it's worth bearing in mind that we're throwing them out because they're distributions, not because they're actually zero. And distributions, you know, might play a role somewhere. Uh, maybe you care about, uh, you know, just because the amplitude is generically zero, maybe the forward limit isn't generically zero, for example. So you need a, it's worth remembering that that's part of the, uh, the vernacular here. We're saying that they're not there, but they're kind of there. OK. And actually, we can continue this. So now that we know that A3, um, uh, having 3, 2 on the right uh, is 0, we find that actually, recursively, A n uh, 2 is actually, you can only get it from bridging um, a three particle k equals 1 on the left. And so it's, there's only one term in the recursion relation, which is a n minus 1, uh, 2, tensor a uh, 3, 1, a single term, which we can actually expand out. So recursively, what we're talking about here is a 3, 2 bridged with a 3, 1, Bridged with, bridged with a three one, n minus three times. So now I haven't exactly proven to you that this is the beautiful formula that Park and Taylor guessed, but I have shown that if we ask this question, what is the probability for, or what is the amp probability amplitude for? two gluons of some helicity to create n minus two gluons of the same helicity, this k equals two process, that the recursion relations give you a single term. There's a single term. And sure enough, of course, it has to be, I mean, come on, Park Taylor were right. So I mean, so anyway, this, so the recursion relations immediately give you that one term formula for this particular helicity configuration. That is incredible on its own. It also gives you remarkably compact formulas for other amplitudes. And I will leave this as a small exercise, but there's, once you know that this vanishes so that you throw away these terms and you throw away these terms, so once you know that you, dis you throw away those things, then you can kind of work out that the number of terms in recursion is equal to a Nariana number, n minus 3 
choose k minus 1. n minus 3, choose k minus 2. So um, you've put in k equals 2 into that formula, and you get 1. If you put n minus 2, or k equals n minus 2 in that formula, you get 1. So the MHV and what's called the MHV bar, the n minus 2 formula. So we can say the same thing here for the MHV bar, which is n minus 2, is uh, a3, 2, merged with a n minus 1, n minus uh, 3. <clears throat> yeah, which is uh, a3, 2, a3, 2, a3, 1. Similar, same thing as that. OK. So beautifully compact formula it immediately proves this Park-Taylor simplicity. But it gives you very short formulas for other amplitudes. Um, for example, for n equals 6 and k equals 3, you get three terms. For n equals 8 and k equals 4, you put it in that formula and you find 20 terms. Okay. But I want to remind you again that the terms that you get are not at all unique. There are many 20-term formulas you can get. Um, no matter how you recurse the corners, you'll always get 20 terms. But it turns out that if you vary all the possible ways of picking which legs to do and which bridges to use on the left amplitude and on the right amplitude, of those for this, for eight particle k equals four, so this is like four gluons go to four gluons, all the same helicity. Um, it turns out that there are um, 2,624 different 20-term formulas that you can get. And the answer is always the plus, the positive sum of 20 fu functions, and there are 2,624 different 20-term formulas you can get. It's a pretty big space. Um, um, interestingly enough, the one that, uh, that, that was written in the original Brito, Cachazo, and Fang paper is not one of them. They actually didn't actually write a formula that was derived by recursion, interestingly enough. In the, they, they saw the recursion, they found one term, and then they, cyclic, they made it cyclically symmetric. So they were kind of, they found a piece, and then they cycled it till they were correct which is not what you get from recursion. Um, anyway, that's a bit of interesting history. OK, so let's find a couple more examples, and then we're going to um, get into the, the, the first one, which I think is the most, you know, the early, the first amplitude, which is not a single term um, here, which is the six particle NMHV, you know, k equals three amplitude. Oh, you also notice that this formula is maximized always when k is equal to n over 2 if n is even. So, which is why 8 particle k equals 4 is 20 terms. It's 10 terms if k equals 1. These are numbers that you kind of, you know, I don't know, you get to know. Um, OK. So let's look at a couple more examples. So for the 6 particle, mm, well, let's, let's build our way up. So for the five particle amplitudes, we have, there are going to be two that are non-vanishing. There's five particle k equals two, which is a single, it starts off as a uh, four particle, well, let's just write it out. So it's um, from that general formula, we have a four two bridged with a th three one, single picture. And if we recurse this thing as well, what we get is a picture of the following kind of ugliness, not so bad. So five, one, this thing is shaded, that thing is empty, four, two, three, and we can color this however we'd like. So we'll put this little thing here. Oh, yeah, I should have actually mentioned that. Um, already at four particles, we had, there were actually two different ways. Remember, I, told, I claimed at least, if Kochi's theorem is right, it's OK, that, that the two different ways of writing this amplitude were the same. That you could have used this bridge with the empty shaded um, two, three, four. But you could have equivalently used 
this bridge. And this statement does not, this equality does not hold without, without caveats in pure Yang Mills. So this is where um, Professor Dixon's comment comes in here. So in n equals four, this is a completely robust statement. In n equals zero in pure Yang Mills, you have to be careful about things. I'm not being careful, that's why, one reason why I introduced n equals four. Okay, so you have this equality. And again, just to, I mean, this is, I really hope everybody here already understands this, but uh, just to be very pedantic about it, this is very different from Feynman diagrams. You do not sum over all the diagrams. You get a representative set of diagrams that you get from recursion. Um, and that set is what you sum. So it's either this or this. Both are the right answer. If you add them up, you get two times the right answer. That's crazy. You do not add up all diagrams. That's, uh, you just get a representative set of diagrams. Okay. So similarly here, we could have recursed this in a couple different ways. We could have changed, we could have put a different version of the four particle graph inside here and we would have gotten the same function. So this here is called the square move and is an important identity. Um, And, uh, and it can sit inside any sub-diagram. So anywhere inside a big diagram, you can change this little box into the other coloring of the box and it's okay. But we also know that this thing is cyclically symmetric. So instead of choosing legs five and one, we could have chosen, well, we could have chosen, uh, well, any other pair we'd like. And the equivalence of those things um, depends on another equivalence relation among these graphs, which, Maybe, uh, well, I'll leave it as an exercise to prove that this implies the cyclicity of the five point, or that these two identities do. But it's that anywhere inside a diagram, if you have a tree of same colored vertices, um, that this is equivalent to um, the tree of same colored vertices drawn the other way around. This is sometimes called the merge and unmerge relation. And in order to, to, if you take this picture and rotate the indices all by one, you get a different picture. And to show that these two are the same, you need to both apply the square move and you need to apply this merge and unmerge relation. I'll show you a more interesting example of that in a few minutes. But that's the, um, um, uh, anyway, so these are the two operations. And it turns out, remarkably enough, so, oh, by the way, this relation is kind of easy to understand. The, Two empty vertices, two vertices of the same color just tell you, in this case, it tells you that all of the lambdas of all these particles here are the same, are proportional to each other. That's the constraint. It's the same constraint here. And as far as the outside function is concerned, it makes no difference whether this, it's this system of constraints or this system of constraints. So the, this move is pretty trivial. And in fact, it sometimes it motivates people to talk about bipartite graphs where you define a vertex like this and then eliminate this redundancy. That's okay, I'm not gonna do that because uh, I like trivalent graphs. <clears throat> but this move is more interesting. Here, this is a much less trivial move. You can't trivialize this move so easily. Um, me, yeah. Is the second rule also just true in n equals four, or is it? Uh... This is actually true in, you can add arrows, it doesn't matter. It's true in general. Okay, and it's the same with also shaded. So shaded, shaded is, is there as well. Okay, so we have one picture here. And for the, um, all right, I'm gonna, I need some space on A52 is this. If we write A53, um, this is going to be a, the three particle on one side, the three particle k equals two on one side, bridged with the same kind of four particle business here. Um, five, one, two, and I guess I'm gonna draw it this way. Uh, three, four. So it's in a different graph, um, and this is, uh, well, yeah, so a single term. This is the MHV bar amplitude is what it's called. Okay, now that we know this, we know the four particle amplitude and we know these five particle amplitudes, we can now represent 
the six particle NMHV amplitude, the first non-trivial one. So let me prep for that. <clears throat> and this, I think, actually is the same conventions that were used in the original paper. So I'm going to drive the same sets of pictures up to a rotation, I guess. But. Yeah, well, well, I'm getting ready for this. You should, I, I hope you are all adequately impressed. Three terms for a six particle amplitude is incredible. Feynman, in the Feynman expansion, we're talking 212. 212 down to three terms is remarkable concision. But it's better than that. We've already seen that we've proven this magic of Park-Taylor so that two gluons create 50. Instead of being more terms than the atoms in the universe, we have one term, if it's all the same helicity. And for the higher K amplitudes, we're talking about huge, huge orders of magnitude improvement. This is not just, you know, I mean, it's easy to see that there isn't much experimental need for a 50 particle process at the LHC. There are a lot of coupling constants in there, right? But, but as a theoretician, having access to these recursion relations gave us access to theoretical data, the right answer. We could suddenly generate extremely rapidly and this and properties of these amplitudes were discovered by having access to these formulas. For example, it was discovered that these pieces, these, in, these terms individually by themselves, enjoyed infinite dimensional symmetries, the yang yin, which was not discovered before these pictures were drawn. Okay, so let's say A6, 3. There are three terms, and um, okay, this is going to require a bit more chalk work than normal. And then we'll take, a, we'll take a break after I draw them. Um, let me just write them out here. So the first term we're going to have, and I want to get the, yeah, a 5, 3 bridged with a 3, 1. So there's that term, which I'm going to draw up here. And then there's a, a, a 4, 2 bridged with A42. And then there's A5, A1232 two, bridged with A5312. Uh, yes. Remember, the Ks have to add up to K plus 1. So we need every, the sum of these upper indices to be 4 in every case. So, OK. So we're going to draw these pictures. And I'm going to use the pictures that we've already worked out for the five particle amplitudes. So when I do this, I'm going to start off with a, uh, a blob and I'm going to put this picture here inside the left side of this diagram. So just bear with me while I draw this. Um, Okay, so here's the bridge. Here is the three particle k equals one. This is, I'm going to label things here, six, one. And then here, I'm just going to glue this picture into it. In particular, I'm going to use these legs are going to be these legs, my five, one. So it looks like this. Um, if I just glue that picture directly in. So I get this funny looking picture, two, three, four, five. It looks like some scary three loop process, but again, it's one of only three terms, not so bad. And again, it's just some rational function, so it's not so, you know, it's a, uh, don't, don't be too concerned about it. So the, the bridging of the four particle amplitudes, you get little boxes on both sides of the bridge. Um, Six, one, two, 
three, four, five. And one more is the uh, three particle k equals two. So that's over there. It's going to be shaded. Then we put in that picture down there over on this side. So it's going to be this, this. Um, get all my shading done correctly. All right, those are our three terms. And it's approximately time for a mid lecture break. So I will, you can take five minutes, you can copy them down if you'd like. Um, um, and we'll, we'll come back to what they actually look like and more things about them in a few minutes. So stand up. <laughs>